I'd now like to welcome John Marsden, Manager, Great Lakes Issue Management and Reporting Section, Environment and Climate Change Canada, and Margaret Guerrero, Director, Land and Chemical Division, United States Environmental Protection Agency. They will be presenting past success in addressing chemicals, Canadian and United States chemical management programs, and recent experience in identifying and addressing chemicals of mutual concern under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. This is the first of three presentations this afternoon. As with this morning, if you have questions, please hold them. We'll be uh, uh, doing another question and answer, answer session on all three uh, topics uh, discussed this afternoon, starting at 325. For those of you watching remotely, you can comment via our Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement email address or direct to the IJC. Thank you. John and Margaret. Thanks very much, uh, Mike, for that introduction. The overall purpose of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement Chemicals Annex is to protect human health and the environment through cooperative and coordinated measures to reduce the anthropogenic releases of chemicals of mutual concern into the Great Lakes. In other words, protect the Great Lakes by identifying and reducing chemicals of mutual concern. In today's, present, in today's presentation, we're going to be covering a number of things. We're going to introduce you to the chemicals annex, set it in context, and outline some of the risks and environmental impacts of harmful chemicals in the Great Lakes Basin ecosystem, a historical overview, and the present status of binational cooperation and collaboration to address chemical pollution under the Water Quality Agreement, binational and domestic actions taken during the first triennial, 2014 through 2016, to manage risks posed by chemicals to the Great Lakes, and finally, moving forward, binational priorities for science and action on chemical pollution in the Great Lakes during the next triennial, 2017 through 2019. Well, the Great Lakes Basin provides us a wealth of natural resources to both citizens of Canada and the United States. As a result, the basin also contains a higher population density and concentration of industrial activity than many other regions. The Great Lakes supports 31% of all Canadian and 10% of all U.S. population, a total of about 40 million people, and provides drinking water to about 30 million of us. The lakes support $180 billion in trade between Canada and the U.S. every year, and they provide for a commercial, tribal, and recreational fishery industry worth billions of dollars. Well, while higher population density and industrial concentration has brought much economic growth and prosperity to the Great Lakes Basin, they can also increase risks from chemical pollution. In addition, certain characteristics of the Great Lakes, for example, residence time and surface area, make the Great Lakes susceptible to long-range atmospheric transport and deposition of persistent chemicals from out-of-basin sources. Chemical pollution is a long-standing and significant concern for the Great Lakes and has, as such has been the focus of international action since the 1970s. Some impacts associated with chemical pollution in the Great Lakes. Certain toxic chemicals can potentially harm ecosystems or negatively affect habitats or biodiversity. Some toxic chemicals are persistent and accumulate within the food web, potentially resulting in human exposure and health effects through fish and wildlife consumption. And finally, toxic chemicals can also disproportionately affect susceptible subpopulations such as children and those who rely on the Great Lakes ecosystem as a source of food. Addressing the threats posed by chemical pollution to the Great Lakes Basin has been and remains a high priority for both Canada and the United States. In the 1980s, impacts to waterfowl and fish were common due to elevated levels of toxic industrial and agricultural chemicals in the Great Lakes. Many of these chemicals were listed and targeted for action under the 1987 Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. For example, polychlorinated biphenyls, or PCBs, mercury, DDT, 
Myrex, and Dioxin. As a result, domestic legislation and programs, as well as coordinated domestic, regional, and binational efforts were undertaken and did result in dramatic decreases to the production, use, and discharge of these chemicals to the Great Lakes. These programs and activities have included things such as the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, the Canadian Chemicals Management Plan, a number of U.S. legislation focused on mitigating chemical pollution, including the Toxic Substances Control Act, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, Superfund, and the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. In addition, the former Great Lakes Binational Toxic Strategy, Lakewide Action and Management Plans, and state, provincial, and tribal collaboration with the federal government have all contributed. Reductions in the use and release of certain harmful chemicals have resulted in significant decreases in their concentrations in the Great Lakes environment. As you heard this morning, the overall status of toxic chemical concentrations in open waters is good and the trend unchanging, and the status in whole fish is fair but improving. For example, we show here some data on mercury. These figures are from the Great Lakes 2016 draft indicator reports and, over, and identify overall decreases in mercury in open water and fish samples. And for some reason, we're only seeing the figure on the right-hand side of the slide. That figure shows that mercury concentrations in Lake Ontario lake trout continue to decline, although at a slow rate, and remain below the 1987 Water Quality Agreement criteria value. In some areas of the Great Lakes, however, mercury and fish have been increasing, and you'll hear more about mercury in a few minutes. Over to you, Margaret. Okay, thanks, John. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, well, John just talked uh, about some good news uh, with respect to chemical pollution in the Great Lakes. Um, and uh, it, it is good news. However, despite significant reductions and the efforts that have gone into uh, achieving those reductions, some chemicals continue to pose threats to the Great Lakes. To address these threats, Canada and the United States continue to work to address chemical pollution under Annex 3, the Chemicals of Mutual Concern Annex of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. And Canada and the U.S. are working with other federal, provincial, state, tribal, and First Nations, as well as local programs to accomplish this work. So under Annex 3, we are taking action on chemicals. As John showed in an earlier slide, the purpose of Annex 3, or the goal of Annex 3, is to reduce releases of chemicals of mutual concern, or CMCs as you'll see throughout the slide as we call them, um, to the waters of the Great Lakes. Annex 3 is composed of several elements that are shown on this slide here. And one of the most important co commitments of the Annex is to identify chemicals of mutual concern, or CMCs. To do this, it includes the development and implementation of a science-based process for designating CMCs, um, a continuous process of designating CMCs on an ongoing basis, and periodically re-evaluating CMCs for action in the Great Lakes Basin. This step is critical because designated CMCs are the focus of nearly all of the other commitments of the Annex. And once designated, the parties have committed to developing binational strategies for all of the CMCs. So um, the goal of the binational strategies is to reduce CMCs in the Great Lakes and develop a strategy to do so. So it could include research monitoring, surveillance activities, pollution prevention, control measures, both regulatory and non-regulatory, all intended to reduce the releases of CMCs into the Great Lakes. Annex 3 also sets out a number of key science commitments for these chemicals, including monitoring and surveillance to track and assess the levels and trends of CMCs in the Great Lakes environment, as well as loadings of these chemicals into the Great Lakes, and also evaluating the effects of CMCs on the Great Lakes, which um, include the research and monitoring surveillance of these chemicals as well as chemicals that may become CMCs in the future. And then finally, information sharing and reporting 
We regularly exchange information from our science programs, and as with all of the other annexes under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, we have committed to reporting on the implementation of the annex every three years through the progress report of the parties. Okay, um, coordination and collaboration with stakeholders is critical to the effective delivery of the commitments under Annex 3. We are engaged with many government and non-government partners to achieve this work. And the uh, formal annex structure includes both a government subcommittee and a larger extended committee with additional stakeholders. The government stakeholder uh, excuse me, the government subcommittee is the um, decision-making body. Members include the federal governments of both Canada and the U.S., state and provincial governments, as well as tribes and First Nations. The extended subcommittee includes all of the members of the government subcommittee, as well as industry and NGO representatives from both Canada and the U.S., as well as observers from the IJC. The extended subcommittee reviews and provides input and recommendations to the governments with regards to decisions and activities under Annex 3. And then um, specific opportunities for stakeholder engagement in Annex 3 implementation include the government subcommittee and extended subcommittee process that I described, but it also in includes meetings like the GLEC biannual meetings, public forum meetings like this one, um, we have created, as part of the annex structure, task teams that develop work products, and these teams are made up of both government and non-government stakeholders. We seek public comments on Annex 3 work products, and we have an, established an external stakeholder candidate CMC nomination process, which I will talk about in a minute. Um, the first three years of Annex 3 implementation have largely focused on designating the first set of CMCs, which formally occurred on May 31st of this year. The eight chemicals or classes of chemicals listed on the slide were designated as part of the first set of CMCs. You'll note that two chemicals, mercury and PCBs, are legacy substances, which have also been targeted for action under past Great Lakes activities. And the remainder are newer or so-called chemicals of emerging concern. There were many steps in the process, and, the achie and this achievement represents a lot of hard work by many people in order to achieve this first set of CMCs. Specifically, it involved first developing a series of criteria, the binational considerations, um, whose purpose is to be used to evaluate candidate CMCs on an ongoing basis using a consistent, science-based, and accountable process. The criteria include things like whether there's evidence of the presence of the chemical in the Great Lakes, is there evidence of risk from the chemical in the Great Lakes, um, what is the risk management status of this chemical in the Great Lakes, and um, are there additional things that can be done to um, remove or reduce releases of this chemical into the Great Lakes. Um, so using these criteria, a set of candidate CMCs were evaluated by a multi-stakeholder task form who summarized their findings in the binational summary reports, which are available on binational.net. And uh, these reports were the basis for designating this first set of CMCs. And as a final step, Additional stakeholder input was provided through public comment on these draft reports. One thing I wanted to note that um, this first CMC designation cycle was a trial run of the process, if you will. Um, there were kinks that we had to work out along the way, and um, the lessons that we learned will be used to improve and streamline the process going forward. Uh, so while designating CMCs has been our primary focus, we've also had some other key achievements in the first three years of implementation. For example, the parties have established and launched a process by which external stakeholders can nominate chemicals for consideration as CMCs, which I mentioned uh, previously. The guidance for doing this is available on binational.net, 
And um, we utilize this process for the second round of nominations. Um, the nomination window for the second round of candidate CMCs is now closed. It closed on August 29th, um, and uh, the parties have begun working through the process of reviewing chemical nominations. And we received one nomination um, from this external process for this round. It's um, radionuclides, and I think John's going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, we also conducted monitoring and surveillance for chemicals during this past um, triennial, including the CMCs and other potential candidates under national monitoring and surveillance programs, as well as regional Great Lakes, Great Lakes specific programs and activities. Um, specifically, we coordinated with the Cooperative Science and Monitoring Initiative. And um, finally, we initiated the development of binational strategies for two of the eight chemicals that have been designated, PCBs and HBCD. And um, given that many government and stakeholders and the public are interested in how we move forward in, the, in developing the binational strategies, um, we've kind of identified this as a pilot process for these first two chemicals, and we intend to take a lot of input um, as we go. So more to come on that, um, but we, we feel that um, this approach will help us or will allow us to review and evaluate the strategy development process in order to improve it and make it the most effective and efficient going forward. And then finally, the remaining strategies are scheduled for development in, uh, the remaining strategies for the other six um, CMCs are is scheduled for development in 2017. Oh, this is the right slide, sorry. <laughs> okay, last slide for me, and then I'm going to um, hand it back over to John. I wanted to cover um, the specific actions on the U.S. side over the last three years. Um, in the first triennial, the U.S. has pursued a number of science policy actions. Um, we are continuing foundational, foundational water quality monitoring and surveillance activities in the Great Lakes watershed through the Great Lakes Fish Monitoring and Surveillance Program, the International Atmospheric Deposition Network, Great Lakes Sediment Monitoring Programs, and National Coastal Conditions Assessment. We have been funding research on the presence, effects, and trends of emerging chemicals, including CMCs, in a variety of media through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. We've closely coordinated actions in the Great Lakes Basin with the work underway for the new amended TOSCA, or the Toxic Substance Control Act, um, to ensure that national chemical risk management enhancements address the needs of the Great Lakes. And, then, and finally, we are documenting the applicable U.S. federal, state, local laws, standards, and regulations for each of the CMCs in the forthcoming binational strategies. Thanks, Margaret. Uh, the Government of Canada continues to assess and manage risks posed by chemicals through our Nationals Chemicals Management Plan. Over 2,760 substances have been assessed, and 364 of those have been concluded to be toxic. For these toxic substances, 81 final risk management instruments have been established, and addis additional instruments are being developed. So all of our first set, all eight of the chemicals of mutual concern in our first round are Schedule I toxic substances under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act. And as such, they're all subject to federal risk management in Canada. For example, through the polychlorinated biphenyl regulations and the prohibition of certain toxic substances regulations. Additionally, Environment and Climate Change Canada has developed federal environmental quality guidelines and supported the development of federal provincial guidelines for many of the first CMCs, including mercury, PCBs, polybrominated diphenyl ethers, or PBDEs, perfluorooctane sulfonate, or PFOS, hexabromocyclododecane, HBCD, and short-chain chlorinated paraffins. Canada is also party to many multilateral environmental agreements aimed at globally reducing environmental and human health effects of chemicals. Examples of those agreements include the Minamata Convention on Mercury and the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants. 
Like US EPA, Environment and Climate Change Canada also delivers a number of foundational water quality monitoring and surveillance activities in the Great Lakes under the National Chemicals Management Plan and regional programs, including our own Great Lakes Surveillance Program and the Great Lakes Fish Contaminant and Sediment Monitoring and Surveillance Programs through which CMCs will continue to be monitored in the Great Lakes. I want to say a word about our Canada-Ontario agreement on the Great Lakes. We're very fortunate that we have a strong partner in the province of Ontario to help us deliver our commitments under the Canada-US Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. So in Canada, our Canada-Ontario Agreement, or COA, is the means by which our program interacts with provincial ministries to help us meet our obligations. COA commitments related to chemicals are listed under the Harmful Pollutants Annex. Moving forward, during the next triennial, 2017 through 2019, delivery of the chemicals annex will be guided by the following proposed binational priorities for science and action. Our first action priority is to continue the development of binational strategies for CMCs that will identify cooperative and coordinated measures to reduce human inputs of CMCs into the waters of the Great Lakes. Secondly, we'll identify and assess additional substances for consideration of CM as CMCs while seeking to utilize the data, input, and expertise of the Chemicals Annex stakeholder community. As Margaret said, we want to acknowledge that we have received a CMC nomination for radionuclides and we'll be reviewing it with other chemicals that are being considered as candidate CMCs by the parties. As for science priorities, we have two. The first is to undertake research, monitoring, and surveillance activities as they're identified in the binational strategies for CMCs in order to address information needs. This work will also support future Great Lakes indicator development. And secondly, we'll coordinate research and monitoring activities to provide an early warning for chemicals that could become CMCs. Thank you very much for your attention.